telemedicine really was a feature that we needed to add into the regular repertoire of physician services. If we were going to lead this industry, we needed to be the ones who did these kinds of services and understood how to best implement and use them. So we realized that there were a lot of docs who thought about it, really felt that the standard of care was hands-on medicine and were really not ready to uh, take that move forward. And we decided, well, you know, we're going to have to create the playbook. We're going to have to help our medical organizations, our state medical societies, find ways to assist their docs in developing uh, the repertoire of services that they could provide uh, through telemedicine. So who could have known that at this point, we would see the world turn on a dime? Uh, and I will go over later what happened to my practice over this course of 30 days in the month of 31 days in the month of March. Um, it was pretty insane. It was an astounding transition from where you could have counted on your hands the number of patients and doctors who were doing uh, telemedicine as a, as a primary way of interacting with patients to where all of a sudden it was upwards of 95%. And if they hadn't implemented it yet, they knew that they were going to soon. And in some ways that's good, in some ways that's bad. A lot of people jumped uh, at uh, platforms and uh, structures that weren't necessarily the best ones. And those are the things that we were trying to create resources for in the TTI. Now, when we look at how we as physicians were working at that time, we were very focused on our medical homes. We wanted to uh, develop the way to best at provide services and take advantage from the economic opportunities of value-based payments. Um, there was still Teladoc out there, um, but there were lots of other ones too, and they all started to float to the surface. And if we noticed what they were advertising, it was pretty pretty, pretty, um, pretty simple and pretty straightforward. It was, you know, you go through a couple of algorithms. Uh, we decide, yes, you need an antibiotic because rarely will we say no. We decide, yes, <clears throat> you need some um, erectile dysfunction medicine or some acne treatment or whatever it was. And patients found this is pretty easy. I could get on at 11 o'clock at night. I'm going to do it. So as we change that, um, we realized that it does fit in. Um, Doctors need to start to do this. And of course, uh, we started to realize we could get a lot better uh, outcomes from doing that. So I'm going to give you a little perspective on my group. As I said, we've got 18 clinicians, four offices. Somebody should mute. It's showing up as Felipe Gomez, so there's a lot of background noise coming from you. If you could mute, please. Dr. Libby, I'm going to mute all, and then you'll need to unmute. So we are PCMH level three. Um, we have uh, a relationship with the primary care IPA. We developed an ACO, we have great contracts, we have a lot of gain share opportunities, we have a really very fluid practice, um, but we are in a high, high density area and um, not many of our docs wanted to stay very late every day. They were willing to come in well, 7.30 and stay till 6.30 maybe, but people were looking for after hours care. Uh, we had a lot of traffic. Uh, schools didn't get out until 3.30. Uh, and people started to recognize that there was convenience. And so about a year and a half ago, I started to investigate telemedicine. Um, I started with some payer-based platforms doing mostly uh, mental health issues, uh, ADHD, medication follow-ups, things of that nature. But I realized this was a, a real parallel experience. I was doing it through a payer-based platform. Uh, I had to reproduce the encounter in my EHR, and it was really not working quite as smoothly as it should. So I talked to my EHR vendor, happens to be a pediatric specialty uh, EMR. Um, they were receptive, but it really wasn't on their radar at the time. Started to work then with a specialty specific newbie, somebody who was developing his platform and wanted to have all the input he could on how it could best work with uh, a, a pediatric practice and 
try to develop a method by which we could really create the resources that we needed to be able to get that buy-in at my practice level. So it was it was an endeavor. It took it took months for people to open their eyes, bother reading the emails, look at the documents that I devised and developed to help them understand how and where we could use it in the office. But I knew that we needed to set it up as part of our regular office day and that everybody in the office should be able to do that. And I did have the vision that we would use it for a lot of different purposes, including um, after hours, including weekends. But initially, it was just get used to using it. Uh, certainly, we had uh, uh, the ability in our office setting, and we had a, a very, uh, let's say, a capable patient population being in a very, uh, let's say, very nice part of Northern Virginia outside of D.C. But we really had to set it up. So the big thing was really understanding how to separate the little tasks and the understanding of what you were doing with each part of your office operation. And that involved the front desk. It involved my triage nurses. It involved my appointment uh, phone uh, operators. It involved the business office. It involved my MAs uh, reminding patients uh, when they see them that they could do a follow-up with a telemedicine visit. It was one of the endeavors that really you had to break into parts and then bring back together, truly executive functioning. Um, and we did that. We were able to do that and make telemedicine a standard office service. Uh, we started with simple care groups, conjunctivitis, um, you know, simple things, asthma, allergy care, things of that nature. And the docs started putting an hour and then two hours into their daily schedule, often during the times when we had some lull in terms of patient visits. Uh, be them in the middle of the day or at certain times uh, in the early evening. And we were able to really come to discover the doctors enjoyed it. They actually felt they were getting a very good experience out of it. And so did the patients. So those, those early things, as we were saying, uh, neurobehavioral psychopharm, triage issues, uh, low acuity, um, college age kids who were away at college and uh, needed to get their meds refilled, or you wanted to check in on them for their anxiety or depression, whatever, early morning, evening. And really the big thing was reminding the staff and reminding the patients that it was there and that they could do it. Um, we did a lot with our website. We did a lot with uh, our portal. We did as much as we could with Facebook. And we just tried to create the opportunity for patients it was taken up, but not that great. And then, of course, along comes uh, COVID, our, our incredible life-changing event here, probably the most significant thing that most of us will encounter from a, a social um, and world view perspective in our lives. You know, it was one of those things that we were aware of, I guess, in January, February, um, it really didn't seem like much more than a distance threat. And we were told it was uh, some foreign country's disease, not ours. Um, we weren't prepared. We really didn't know what to expect, um, but we did have some sense of fear. We knew that there were kinds of, uh, of viruses like this, the coronavirus that, that could create a pretty severe disease and could be spread rather, relatively easy. But then all of a sudden it starts in a nursing home. It's in, uh, in Washington state. And then all of a sudden we start to see the sparks blowing across the country. And the next thing we know, uh, it, it is an epidemic. This pandemic has become an epidemic in, in every major urban area around the country. Some more acutely, some more quickly than others. But now we're watching Manhattan and it's, it's, it's like, what is Kurt Russell was in that movie, Escape from Manhattan, um, or Escape from New York or whatever. But uh, I, I can't even imagine um, what it's like having to get your elevator to go up to, um, uh, to your uh, floor if you're living in a high rise there. Anyway, um, with all this and with all this trepidation, we know that telemedicine makes sense. And the, the actual sea change that occurred in our uh, medical care providing uh, was astounding. I, I can't say that anything doctors have done in, in the history of medicine have changed so quickly. In a period of a month, the, uh, the process uh, of transitioning 
from really being not particularly interested in telemedicine uh, or at least peripherally only to it becoming a major way to deliver care uh, took place. Um, and you know what? So do the feds. Uh, they, uh, they agree this is the best way to contain patients in a safe place. Uh, unfortunately, not all our payers are agreeing. So yes, it becomes the charming charming of healthcare, right? Um, you can't even get enough of it anymore. And um, it's been coming off the shelf as quick as it can get out there. Um, you want to screen for these patients. Of course, uh, one of the things that we discovered was that uh, we really didn't want to see all those patients in our office. And we were advised not to. We didn't want our staff uh, to get sick. And of course, who had any PPE? Um, and at that point, uh, we knew that we had to start screening so we wouldn't send them to the ER and overload them with unnecessary visits from people who weren't that terribly sick. So we started to screen uh, our patient population for those who were worried they might have been exposed or had a family member who traveled or uh, had some simple symptoms or something of that nature. And so we uh, we started to screen on telemedicine. Um, and then patients, of course, started canceling appointments. Uh, our local health systems were totally unprepared. We had no testing, especially in kids. Uh, probably two and a half weeks into it, we had one testing center, and it was probably 25 miles from uh, that northern Virginia area. Now it's improved a bit, but it is a really, really difficult situation. Then, of course, the health systems and uh, the feds and everyone else said, you're in lockdown. Um, you're not going to go anywhere. You're not going to uh, unnecessary medical visits. You're not getting your elective surgeries. And all of a sudden, we had an incredible downturn in the number of visits. Um, so as we got into this at the practice, uh, we started to think, uh, how can we protect our staff? How can we keep them employed? How can we stay open and continue with generating revenue? Um, who's going to come to the office? And you know, is, will it be our little kids for well checks? Well, a lot of them were not particularly happy or uh, feeling safe doing that. Um, who's going to work there? Because we had people who were afraid to come into the office and we had some seniors, uh, myself included, who really were in a high risk category and shouldn't be seeing patients at this point. And if we did open, would we be able to get labs and what kind of labs would we get? And could we give our immunizations? I mean, that's a huge piece of pediatrics. Uh, our revenue generation is you know, probably 30% from these kinds of uh, uh, financial outlays. And so how do you develop a financial plan? And it doesn't really matter what the CARES Act says, uh, there is a huge stress and an impetus for us to find other ways to provide care. So we started doing telemedicine uh, 24 seven, and this will just give you an outline of what happens in a primary care office when uh, the COVID comes into town. Um, you know, in the first week of March, it was pretty standard. We had uh, 933 visits. Only five of them actually were telemedicine visits. Uh, in the second week, uh, it was 896, pretty standard still. You know, we're sort of getting into that phase where Kids aren't getting as many viruses. Maybe that was part of it, but nonetheless, a few more telemedicines. Third week, as this wave came around, we saw office visits drop by more than half. And we had 202 telemedicine visits that week. And by the fourth week, uh, we were down to 152 office visits in four offices. Of course, we've closed two of them to regular visits and have two open six days a week now but 266 telemedicine visits. And this uh, more or less shows you that uh, total patient visits and what's happened. If it hasn't come to you yet, and for many of you, I'm sure it has, um, it will be there very soon. And with that, it's not just the visits, it's what you can do during those visits that generates the revenue. Uh, and all of a sudden that is gone. But at the same token, you see that the transition we went through from that first week uh, with mostly office visits to where now telemedicine actually is our major vehicle for patient visits. And in fact, right now, um, we are working with our payers. Uh, we're developing the templates and working with our uh, EMR company to develop uh, the kinds of um, uh, tools that we need to be able to do our preventive care. Um, a big part of our, our business is taking care of kids under the age of two and giving them timely immunization. So 
We've developed a lot of support and we're trying to get our payers. We've got two local payers willing to pay us uh, uh, at par with face-to-face uh, well checks. We're developing strategies for doing drive-by immunizations. Um, we're working on it. It is every day, it's a different day in the office, uh, a different way and a different strategy, and we're learning on the run. Um, fortunately, uh, we have seen that uh, we are able to, um, to adapt and adjust. I don't know if we'll catch up to those revenues as quickly as we need to, but we're doing everything we can to get there. We're promoting it, as I said, every which way we can. We've made ourselves available for walk-ins and scheduling uh, anything that people want. Uh, in particular, we've developed a, a module around anxiety and depression since a lot of kids have that as a baseline and uh, being isolated away from your social opportunities, not being able to finish your uh, your plans for going to college and probably not even going to college in the fall uh, is a pretty stressful event for a lot of kids. And we feel that we can do a lot of good for them. We've developed those templates, as I said, we've uh, got surveys and screens um, and we can use those and get paid for those. Um, you need to pressure your EMR vendor to find ways to integrate this platform um, and not necessarily always pick the one that's easiest and the one that's most available, but one that has some perspective as to how you can implement, make it meaningful for your practice for the years to come. And those are some of the resources we've developed and hope to help you use uh, as we go through this process in the DTI. And you have to bill. You have to bill for the, every service you do. Now you have phone uh, codes that you can actually bill for through Medicare. You have, uh, and many of the payers as well. You have uh, nurse care that you can bill for. You have to make sure you find every place you can bill and do that. Uh, it is not uh, being abusive. It's actually being uh, utilitarian. It's being the way you have to perform. And the patients need that service. They'll appreciate that service. Um, and you need to be able to, to provide it. Um, your EMR might be able to select out patients who need specific types of chronic or other periodic visits, uh, refills, uh, and may be at risk for prior diagnoses that may be of substance or significance. You need to build your billing process into your templates, of course, and then you have to monitor your, uh, your payment and make sure you're getting it in a timely fashion at the rates that are reasonable that... Uh, either you've negotiated or are required by your state, because we do know that payers right now are sitting on a large, let's say, wheelbarrow of cash. They aren't paying for a lot of things at the hospital. Yeah, they'll claim that uh, that intensive care potential is going to ruin them. Uh, many of them won't pay for that either. Um, it's going to be an interesting outcome. But I think that uh, one of the things we need to uh, really advocate for at our state level is um, is to get some of those savings that they are experiencing uh, and to share them with physician practices up front. We need it now. And, and the CARES Act isn't going to save uh, many or all practices. Uh, it may help. It may take us through a two or three months of transition, but it's going to be a long time. It's going to be a hard road. And if they want to have access to care once this is said and done, hopefully that'll be soon. Uh, they're going to need to help us, and they have the cash. They should be sharing it. Um, we want to encourage our patients to stay in their medical home. Uh, we want to make sure our payers are paying for those visits at face-to-face -face rates, and that more than anything, at least for us as pediatricians, and as we get further into this, they need to include those preventive care codes in those, uh, 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 those payment uh, paradigms. And they shouldn't be modifying anything that we're doing. So what are some of the dark sides of COVID and what it has done in this incredible surge for doctors to incorporate telemedicine? Well, one thing is that the quick uptake has sometimes precipitated people buying the wrong product and for the wrong reasons. And right now it seems okay. Um, you know, uh, they've suspended HIPAA, uh, but not for long, you can be sure. And, you know, some states have even suspended medical liability, but you can be sure that's not for long. And any uh, lawyer worth his hoots is going to be able to work his way around that. Uh, so you have to be cognizant of the legal issues around this. You want to use a secure platform. Um, you don't want to pick something that doesn't really have a, an inclination to support the kind of subspecialty you're in. Uh, many of them have been developed over the years uh, that help to support uh, specialties and 
can really be something that you can have a long-term, uh, let's say, evolution with. They have uh, uh, different kinds of templates that fit your specific set of diagnoses. They have uh, billing paradigms that help you to find the best way and most efficient and, and uh, appropriate way to bill for the services you provide. Uh, a lot of these platforms are just literally audiovisual uh, platforms that don't necessarily provide all that. So we have to be careful. There's a lot of opportunists out there, obviously, in the PPE world. Uh, we've all dealt with uh, people wanting to sell us masks for $4 a piece, and uh, you can smell uh, the pie cooking in the oven through it. Um, CMS uh, certainly has relaxed its rules. It's amazing to me that we have spent so much for so long lobbying for them to release us from some of those rules. And in one fell swoop, <laughs> they have just pushed them off the table. We are remarkably uh, blessed with some of those changes, but others aren't necessarily great. Um, they're going to let anybody do anything from anywhere. I'm not sure that's a great idea. Uh, we have to maintain this physician-led healthcare, and that's really an important thing for us. Um, facility costs, they're going to go on. Uh, we're going to be getting very close to a margin that starts to put us into negative territory, and we're going to see practices close. We're going to see a lot of jobs lost. In fact, the healthcare sector was probably next, let's say, after the uh, hospitality industry was the largest job loss sector in um, in the in the country over the last two, two weeks. Uh, and doctors are going to get burned out. I don't know about you, but every day it's like there's a whole new territory, and this quicksand gets deeper with COVID-related issues, practice uh, frailty issues, all the things we need to do. Of course, television. Um, all we see is news about how pessimistic people are and how horrible it is. Reruns. There's nothing new, nothing good to watch on television. And sports. My God, we have to watch reruns of old games. Getting sick of that one, too. And I'm sorry to say that some of those interlopers are still thriving. So what are the uh, silver linings that we might find in those clouds? Well, we are seeing more health information te technology interoperating, which is a huge thing for us, something that we've been trying to invest in, trying to break down the, the proprietary walls and get to happen. It's happening. Um, we're getting more connected to the medical home. If you can establish that relationship with your patients, they trust you on the telemedicine mod, uh, platform, you're going to find that you have a much more dedicated patient population. They aren't going to go to those uh, consumer-directed uh, outlets. They're going to come back to you. They want to have that relationship. We're seeing better outcomes. I think you're certainly seeing reduced care costs, but there are payment opportunities within the situation. And as I said, the CMS rules changes uh, have really made a difference too. Uh, hopefully people will have a better diet. Some will binge, but some will just buy healthy foods. And hopefully that's what we'll see. And certainly pollution's down significantly. And most of us have just turned off the TV because we don't have any sports to watch. We're sick of those old games and we aren't into the bad news anymore. Um, there are some golden linings as well. And I think that the biggest one is that doctors basically have realized telemedicine is feasible and it is actually a, a very uh, practical part of their patient uh, care and their practice operations. Uh, and that many of the value-based contracts that we've been sort of more or less corralled into participating in, and most of us have, uh, actually will find that there are rewards and uh, margins to be created by virtue of the cost containment that we can create through better monitoring and interaction with our patients through telemedicine. And I would say that, you know, in the sad but, but strong uh, presence of physicians uh, leading the healthcare charge in this incredible uh, war, uh, we aren't the military, but we have been elevated to uh, a hero status, I think. It's remarkable to see what doctors have done, how they've stepped up, and how they put their lives on the line to help patients. And I think that we're seeing an incredible resurgence of appreciation for who we are, what we've dedicated our lives to do, and how that happens. So this is not one that I wanted to include. That's okay, but this was. Um, it is a surreal experience. Uh, I feel like I'm uh, in a Salvador Dali landscape. So thank you all, and uh, um, I will turn it back over to uh, uh, the, um, the group. Thanks, Dr. Libby. 
Meg, I believe we have a couple of questions, at least one. Do you want to take that? Sure. Yeah, sure. Okay. Um, let me start. So, uh, yeah. Um, Chris from MMS um, says they'd love to do well child and adult visits, but the need for a thorough exam seems to be the limiting factor. Um, can someone address what level of exam is needed? Dr. Libby, do you want to kick that one off? I sure can. Uh, it's remarkable when you get a family on the phone. First of all, those of us who do practice medicine realize, of course, the history and that interaction is a huge piece. Obviously, there are some kids with uh, disabilities or other chronic conditions or acute uh, signs and symptoms that may require a physical exam, but it's remarkable what you can observe um, through the telescreen. Uh, and you can ask parents to do maneuvers. I know we have adjusted our templates uh, to reflect what we see. Does the child look like they're hearing normally? Are they socially interactive in an appro age appropriate fashion? Um, take off their shirt, let me watch them breathe. Uh, are they in any respiratory distress? Is that respiratory rate pretty normal? Um, are their 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 uh, nares flaring? I mean, there are different things that you can use as the indices and you put those into your physical exam. Uh, if a baby is uh, is screaming a lot or you know, a child has got belly pain, you can ask the parent to, to touch the belly. Uh, you can see the reaction on their face. I mean, there are things that you can do. And if you feel worried about that particular uh, exam, then you have to sometimes have them come in for uh, uh, an actual in-office visit or if they look more severe, you send them to the uh, emergency room. But once you've gone through this a number of times, uh, you realize that, that you're really, um, you are capable of observing a lot. You've learned a lot. There are some tools out there. Um, there are some that'll look at the pharynx, some that'll look at the ears, some uh, apps that you can uh, attach to phones that will uh, give you uh, breath sounds. Uh, you can get ambulatory ultrasound. You can get all kinds of things that people can use. And I think that what we'll find as part of this telehealth initiative is, uh, is that there are other attributes that uh, we've been exploring that will be shared through the course of time and will be implemented and offered to you in ways that will allow you to then adjust and adapt. I'll, I'll take one little thing about this, Dr. Garfalo. We're actually having um, a current conversation with the National um, Chapter of Pediatric on the, same, um, on the same issue. And we've talked to Dr. Libby as well. Um, uh, and we talked to the AMA folks um, and we're hoping to, to talk to the national chapter as well um, um, on this particular issue regarding the wellness and um, the preventative care visits. I think they have to be maintained. And I think that uh, we have no idea how long this is going to go on. It could be for months and the after effect could go on for months and families that need a lot of the developmental, psychological, and family support uh, need to contact and connect with us. If we have time for two more quick questions before moving on, um, one was from Kuling from Florida. Is, is there a good telemedicine course specific to exams? And um, Dr. Levy, do you wanna take that one? And then Matt, if, if there's anything following up that you wanna layer in? I, you know, and I will just say, over course of, of four weeks, the transition of hundreds of thousands of doctors from completely ignoring telemedicine to completely endorsing and embracing it has been incredible. I don't think that necessarily all of those resources have evolved. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm sure that um, we will work on creating those and make them uh, standard for sharing with all of our state medical organizations in ways that can help uh, everyone everywhere. Agreed. And then Drew from um, MMS says, to what extent can remote patient monitoring be prioritized to take care of vulnerable populations and any suggestions for kind of business model sustainability as a result of that? Um, Basan, do you want to start us off? And then Stacey, you might have some thoughts on that too from our ROI work. Um, so I will say it's, it really depends on your so what is your projection for this time period on what are you prioritizing on? So it just it really depends on your, your patient mix and your, your population, your sick population. Um, and I think this is part of the business plan that you will put for your office on 
how are you going to triage or how are you currently being triaging? So are you, um, it's like your, your sick ones, you know, sick patients first, or you're, you're, you're coming um, to your remote patients um, after. So it's, this is, I think it really depends on your business model of what you're trying to do for this current period. And I think it would be also according to the time. So if you're planning, you know, a month, three months, six month plan, um, because we don't know how long this can last and hopefully it would not last long. So I think it really depends on your, your patient case and uh, your patient case mix and, and their equity level. Yeah, I think that's a great point, Isan. Um, And we do have a, a playbook that lays out some kind of considerations for, well, it's a full playbook on remote patient monitoring and using that in practice, um, but specifically to the business model kind of return on investment aspect of this. Um, you know, there are the codes that are available now. So, um, you know, that is at least something that we can start using. Those are covered um, and they were covered pre-COVID. Um, but we've really um, embarked on kind of a, it's a longer project um, around kind of trying to um, create a full resource calculator around the ROI for digital health and the implementation of digital health. And um, I think uh, some sometimes naturally you go to the financial aspects when you start to talk about ROI, but um, there are other things that maybe aren't necessarily um, you know, on the income statement or, you know, you aren't going to see in revenue, but you can think about um, when you're using remote patient monitoring. So for instance, if you are leveraging that tool for some of these populations, um, is that going to eliminate some of your no-shows that ultimately then, you know, you can open, have those slots available for patients coming in, or maybe, you know, you don't need these patients to come in, you're able to remote um, remotely monitor them so that just opens up access on your schedule for other types of more acute situations that you might incur. So those are kind of some of the ways we're starting to think about how you translate some traditionally maybe non-financial aspects of healthcare and, and turn it into that kind of dollar sign. So that's definitely something we can stay connected on and happy to kind of even talk a little bit further offline about that. Um, I want to just say a little thing about the the, the previous question. Um, I know Shannon had done the um, the podcast uh, with one of the physicians um, in this matter for conducting a physical exam. And we have one of our cohort as well here, Dr. Kate Atkinson, had done a small video as well to give us some tips of uh, because she had uh, been doing telemedicine now for quite some time since um, COVID started. Um, and, and she, she gave some tips and we're actively, um, and I can send this to the group as well. Um, and Shannon, probably if you want to share your podcast as well. Thank you, Bisan, we'll do.